Um, now the Torah portion for today is called Reshit, and in Hebrew it means the beginning. The English name Genesis comes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and Genesis means origins. Therefore, the Greek name for the first book of the Bible means the book of origins. Now, the Genesis describes the origins of everything. It begins with the origins of the universe, focuses on the origins of man, and then explores the origins of the nation of Israel. Now, as we study this, uh, this first reading from the book of Genesis, we'll learn a great deal about God, but even more maybe about ourselves, and after all, this is a story of our origins too. When properly understood, the story of our origins kind of helps determine our destination, where we're going. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning is talking about the beginning of what we know as our universe. God has always existed. So, uh, because, you know, he's outside of time and space. We just can't really describe him in any way that is adequate in our, in our language. And we can't understand all of the dimensions of God because he is multidimensional. Now, we normally, uh, maybe I can give you an example, okay, of dimensional things. Okay, you see this here? And this is just a cube, okay? made out of a block of wood, and it's, you know, it's heavy, and if I were to throw it at you and hit you on the head with it, you would feel it, you'd get a goose egg, and I'd get an assault charge, okay? <laughs> so it is heavy, it's something. And so, if uh, you, you can see it, that's three-dimensional, all right? But now, what happens if I just, show you something like this and what what do you see you just see a square you don't see it's flat right you don't see that there's a block back there behind it that's all you get to see well, what if I showed you this now what do you see just a lot huh nothing Put your glasses on. <laughs> All right, you just see a little line there, right? That's all you can see. But guess what? That block is still there. Now, what about this? A point, yeah. Well, what's the point? Put it on all right, now, what do you see there? Nothing. You see nothing. But guess what? It's still there. It's still there. Sometimes when we think that we don't see God, he's still there. He's still there. Now, all right, so that was that was my little show and tell for you for uh, so that, uh, you know, Is the point of it is that God is multidimensional, and uh, if you if you look, you know we normally deal with three dimensions: length, depth, and height. <coughs> three different directions, and maybe fourth dimension would be um, time, if you wanted to count that. And what's the fifth dimension? It's a rock group, okay? Uh, huh? There you go. Uh, but there are, from what I, I read from, uh, in fact, the, uh, um, the a fourth dimension, there's also a fourth dimensional cube up there, and that's called a tesseract. Okay? And, uh, but dimensions are kind of hard to explain. There, the physicists tell us that there are 11 different dimensions, okay? And uh, so I'm not even gonna try to explain it to you this morning because you know why? Because I can't, I don't know how they do, how they come up with that. 
But they, they say that there are 11 different dimensions. And other ones say, oh, no, no, there are 26 different dimensions out there. And so I know that God operates in whatever dimension there is. He is there no matter where, when, or what. And we know that the world and the, the spirit realm is in another dimension also. So uh, there's just lots of things that we don't understand about God in this beginning there in, in, um, in Better Sheet, in, in uh, Genesis. Now, God is all of that. He's this, you know, represented by the, the cube here. You know, he's all of that plus a whole lot more. Uh, because he exists outside of time and space. Now, he has always existed, and you know, there is a Jewish concept, uh, a, a Kabbalistic concept, that is called Sinsum. I don't know have you, if you've ever heard of that before. And um, it comes from a, a Jewish mysticism. Okay, so we're not going to build any doctrine on this. I just thought it was kind of interesting, that's all. Um, and it, uh, it originated actually during the Middle Ages, and it proposes that God is so encompassing of everything. He is just so large that uh, he had to voluntarily reduce his existence enough that he could have room to, to uh, uh, create the universe. Now, look how big the universe is. And that God just, you know, he shrunk back just a tiny bit to create a universe that would take us light years to travel from one uh, one uh, end to the other, and maybe even then we wouldn't get there. This is a uh, this is an important concept because it raises the question of free will versus predetermination. In contracting His presence from the cosmos, God leaves us room for human beings to express their faith and independence, but His infinitesimal departure, I guess you'd say, also opens up space for human beings to sin and to, you know, give in to temptation. You know, that's a kind of a double-edged sword there. And so, this, uh, this metaphysical contraction of God leaves uh, uh, the world in a broken shape with responsibility of mankind to repair the broken space. As Messianic Jews, we know that this theory is dismally flawed, okay, because we know that we need the Messiah, we can't fix the world, Messiah can, and the idea of, of Adonai contracting himself to make room for humanity is, is an interesting thought, but no more than that. I just thought I'd bring that out to you this morning, something that you probably had never heard of before, and uh, this, uh, this first uh, phrase that, uh, that um, we have in the Bible, there is, uh, there are two, well, there's actually a couple of words that I want to bring out. And the word that's uh, um, uh, high top, uh, high ta is uh, was, and it's, uh, it's uh, or high ya, it's uh, translated was, but it can also be translated as became. So that we can say the world became without form and void. Think about it. In the first verse, it said, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? That's verse 1. Then it says, the earth was without form and void. The earth became without form and void. What happened between verse 1 and verse 2? A whole lot. A whole lot. We don't know. But we do know that Satan was cast out of heaven for rebellion. And he, uh, his realm was the earth of the universe. And so, guess what? He messed it up big time. Everything that Satan touches turns to mess. All right? That's just a nice way of saying it. And so, he turned the world into a mess. God did not create the world in a uh, form that was, uh, that was without form, and it was void, and it was nothingness. It was not messy. When he created the heavens and the earth, it was perfect. Amen. Satan messed it up. Okay? So there's a whole lot that happened between verse 1 and verse 2. The Bible just doesn't tell us about it. That's all. And so, um, now, hopefully none of you are going to get up and walk out because I've upset uh, some 
theologies here, but uh, stick with me here. God didn't create a world of chaos and waste. He is not the God of chaos. He doesn't create junk. All right? Keep that in mind as we go on. When he created you, he did not create junk. He created a work of art, a life, a human being. All right? Each one of us are special. Each one of us has our own DNA that is different from everybody else. Even identical twins are not exactly identical because their DNA is not exactly identical. So they tell me. I can't see DNA, but that's what they tell me anyway. God didn't create junk, and he doesn't make mistakes when he creates. That's right. That's why I tell people all the time, you know, they, they say, well, I wish I was Jewish. God made me, you know, and, and there are, there, there's ones out there that uh, say, well, if you become a believer in, in uh, Yeshua, then God makes you Jewish. No, you're just grafted in. Well, guess what? You just have to be grafted back in, too. Yeah. So we're all grafted in, whether you're uh, Jew or Gentile. All right? God didn't make a mistake in that regard. He put you in the family that he wanted you in for a purpose. Amen. All right? So when, you, uh, you know, you can say, yeah, God made me a Gentile. And you can proudly say, God made me a Gentile because he doesn't make mistakes and he doesn't create junk. All right? Can I say that again? He does not create junk. And so, uh, and I tell people all the time, Gentiles have a special purpose in the kingdom of God. They can do things that a Jewish person cannot do. You know what that is? You can provoke a Jew to jealousy. You know, you as a Gentile, if you're a Gentile out there, you can provoke a Jewish person to jealousy. Well, me, all I can do with a Jewish person is just to aggravate them to death. Okay? I almost said something that we shouldn't have said on, on TV. I, I can just aggravate them. I can make them angry. But I can't really provoke a Jewish person to, to uh, jealousy with my... Torah observance or whatever, because they said, "Well, you're Jewish. You, 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 you know, you're expected to do that." But what about the Gentile that's, that's following Torah better than the Jew does? That's what you're there for, is to follow God's precepts. Okay, that was not in my notes, as you probably figured that out back there. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, there's a couple of words there that uh, that was hayah. It meant that it became formless and void because of Satan. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's another thing that the, the words that, uh, that uh, are there, the tohu and bohu, I don't know if you picked that up when I was reading that this morning or canting it, the tohu and the bohu is the form and uh, without form and without void. And so, uh, yeah, there, 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 there's the words there that, uh, um, just interesting, interesting words, very interesting words. Now, one thing that caught my eye on this was said the Ruach Elohim was hovering over this form, this formless void, this mess, this chaos. He was hovering over it. And uh, just guess what? When God starts hovering over something and he starts looking into something, things start changing. When God's Spirit gets involved, things start changing, okay? You think about that for a minute. When, uh, when God's Spirit shows up, there is no room for chaos or disorder. And so from this point on, then we see the creation as we know it today. So perhaps it was just a recreation where God was, I know this is blowing a lot of your, uh, your theology right out the window, but uh, it, it really doesn't matter whether it was the first creation or the second creation. God made it. And this is the one that we're dealing with now, today. All right? And so I don't know what happened in between first, uh, the first verse and the second verse. But at any rate, um, there was a lot of time. Now this word hover that uh, uh, is there in verse 2 is uh, rachafet. And uh, it's... Uh, the only other place that it's used, this verb is used like that, is in Deuteronomy 32, 11, where it describes a mother beating her wings over her little ones, <coughs> encouraging them to fly. Okay, that's what it, 
that you get the idea of a mother bird uh, like, uh, you know, we, we have lots of birds around our place. And sometimes we watch, you know, we'll have a nest that we can see. And we see the development, you know, the eggs and then the, you know, the little uh, um, um, birds and the mother feeds them and then they, they start growing those feathers and they get to the point then they're ready to go, you know, and the mother's out there trying to get them going. So, uh, unlike the, Biblon uh, the uh, Babylonian myth of creation, in which the chaos is an enemy to be conquered, this formless mess was to be loved and fostered into being. That's what God did. It wasn't an enemy. He loved it and fostered it into being. One of the earliest uh, Jewish commentaries on this text, dating from New Testament times, interpreted it this way. A spirit of love before the Lord was blowing or hovering over the face of the water. It was a spirit of love. This holy wind is not part of the chaos. It's God's motherly love conveying the promise of life, order, and beauty to what was in itself just a big mess. Now God's the spirit was hovering over it because he loved it, loved us. And when he does that, the chaos then becomes promise. Now Yeshua used the same kind of imagery in describing his love for Jerusalem. In Luke 13, 34, it says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her. How often I long to gather your children together as a, a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He was lamenting the future of Jerusalem because he knew what the future held and the desolation that was to come. He longed for them to be saved because we know that God is not willing that any should perish. No one is to be lost, okay? No one is predestined to be lost. No one is damned from birth, okay? Uh, regardless of what some theologians have said, that you know, the predestination and, and all that, no. We're all predestined to be saved. God wants us all to come to repentance. He wants us all to be with Him. That's why He created us. He did not create us so that He could throw us away and then we'd be in, in uh, you know, a, away from Him in, in hell or wherever uh, for eternity. No, He created us to be with us and to um, to um, fellowship with us. And we were, uh, uh, I was discussing my thoughts on this uh, this drop uh, with uh, my daughter Cynthia, and she says, well, you know what, this this <coughs> hovering, it, what it, it uh, brings to mind for me, said that uh, when she thinks of that, she thinks the Spirit of God hovering over the earth, well, she sees a new husband hovering over his precious bride. Okay, and she says, Dad, you're not going to like this image because it's so girly, but she, that's what I think of it. And I thought, well, that's good, that's good. I think it's a great example of what Yeshua was saying. And in fact, it's, 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 it's actually nicer and prettier, the, the, the husband hovering over that new bride, rather than a chicken out in a chicken out. Know, <laughs> you know, let's, let's face it. A husband should be there to protect his wife, see to her needs, and support her in difficulties that she may face. You know, it, it's kind of fun to watch newlyweds, all right? And uh, because you see that that husband, you know, any, anything that uh, his wife, if he's a good husband, everything, he's trying to try to, uh, to uh, uh, anticipate her needs and get up and do whatever it is that... Uh, you know, that she needs, and, and he's there to protect her, and, and uh, so forth, and so if you've gotten out of that in your marriage, guys, get back to it, okay? Life will go a whole lot better, you know? Uh, you know you know the saying, happy wife, happy life, you know? The wife says, happy husband, nothing <laughs> rhymes with husband, oh well. <laughs> so... Rob Shaul, the Apostle Paul, char uh, he charged husbands in his letter to the congregation at uh, Ephesus. He said uh, uh, in uh, Ephesians uh, 5, 25 to 33, and I'm going to read the whole thing because it, it's just it's the whole thought is you need it. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah also loved his community 
and gave himself up for her to make her holy, having cleansed her by immersion in the word. Messiah did so that he might present to himself his glorious community, not having stain or wrinkle or any such thing, but in order that she might be holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Messiah also does his community, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm talking about Messiah and his community in, uh, in case in any case, let each of you love his own wife as himself and let the wife respect her husband. So what a, what a beautiful picture to me of the Spirit of God hovering over us. That idea of that, that husband taking care of that brand new bride. You know, I was just, um, while there's still on their honeymoon, okay? Hopefully your honeymoon will last a long, long time, okay? Um, it, can, it can even last. 50 years, okay? Rocky spots in the, in the honeymoon, but it can last almost 50 years, I can tell you. So we recognize the relevance of this image in our own lives. At times we feel like our lives are a mess. Do you ever feel like that? That your, that your life is just a, a mess? I know I do sometimes. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's no light. We're floating around like a cork in the ocean, you know, and, and we try to fight it and, and to no avail. And so we, uh, we try to flee. There's no exit. So what do you do? We lift up our petition to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to hover over our mess. To embrace it lovingly and prepare it for the light of God's word. If any of our chaotic depths surface, then we turn them over to the Lord. Now, as, uh, as the powerful but wordless spirit, you know, the the Holy Spirit hovering over the, the waters. He didn't say anything, but he prepared for God's cosmic work. God was the one that spoke things in, the, in existence. His spirit was hovering over it, but it was God that, uh, that uh, spoke the words. The, the Holy Spirit lovingly prepares our chaos for the word that will give uh, shape and meaning to you know, what made no sense at all before. No matter what our chaos is, no, our chaos is, 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 there's no chaos that we would have that would be big enough and, uh, and uh, chaotic enough that God could calm it down. He can calm all the seas. I remember uh, many, 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 many years ago when I first started going to sea, that was kind of a daunting thing for me, a, a kid from Texas to go out to sea and you don't see any any uh, land anywhere. It's just water. And you're just bouncing around and uh, so forth. And there was you know, the verse in the Bible says, where can I go to be away from your spirit? If I take up the wings and, and you know, I can't, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it now, some of you can can uh, think of it, but it says, uh, if I take up wings and, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the, uh, the sea, there you are, you're still there. And so I, I took that verse and just made it my own. Thing. Okay, yeah, no matter where I am, God is still there and he's still taking care of me. He's still watching over me because, uh, you know, even though people have been going to sea for thousands of years, I hadn't. And so it was, it was new and it was daunting to me. And so I needed that comfort. And you know, guess what? God was there no matter where I went. And I went, I uh, sailed uh, over the years, I think I've sailed five of the seven seas. And uh, you know, you've done all the crossings in here and there and everywhere. And, uh, and uh, you got these certificates and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I got kind of used to it. Got to where I enjoyed it. I liked going to sea. I really did. And so uh, you get to that point where you know that God is taking care of you, that no matter how chaotic the world is, 
that he's got you right there in the, in the palm of his hand. Remember, God is not the author of confusion or chaos. He didn't create junk when he created you. And uh, yeah, our lives sometimes fall apart. They really do. We get sick. We fail God. We fail our friends and families. And we oftentimes fail ourselves. But the Spirit of God is hovering over our chaotic lives, just like he did at creation. And he's there to bring uh, order and beauty to our messy, you know, our messy lives, our messy past. So bring your problems to the Lord. You can get nothing else out of this, uh, this uh, drosh this morning. Bring your problems to the Lord. He will hear you. His Holy Spirit is hovering over you. Then when you do that, you bring your problems to Him. Then leave them with Him. Don't put them back in your backpack and take them home with you. Okay? Let God take care of it. And He will.